So this handsome young buck is Mark Dainsey Dana. First of his name. And well known and loved for making all sorts of wonderful things out of wood, especially pallet wood. Not only is he a talented woodworker, he's a bit of a jack of all trades. He's a whiz when it comes to CAD. I need to quickly come up with some CAD drawings, so hang on a second. All right, there it is. A master at being a full business human. I might keep some of those bitcoins in there and no one's ever gonna find them. A bit of a math savant. Not two, 20. Sorry, 200, 200 mils short. Basically, to put it really bluntly, he's a bloody good bastard, I'll tell you. Now, Dainsey loves to set a woodworking challenge, and last year was the Off Cuts 23 challenge, where I made this clock entirely out of form ply scraps. And this time in 2024, he's at it again. The challenge is clutter clean out 24. Pretty much look in every single corner in your shed and look at the stuff that just sits there. Turn that stuff into something, that's it. So that's what I'm going to do. In this video, I'm going to take some very special wood that has a very unique and very old story to tell and turn it into a special gift for a future someone coming very soon. <laughs> Well, good morning, folks. Here we are. Welcome to not my workshop, but my garage. And today, for the build challenge, we're going to be talking about this wood. Now, this wood here, I've had in my garage for about two years, or ever since I moved in, it's always been basically here. It's the only spot it fits, and it's taking up a lot of room. And my wife is starting to ask me, what are you going to do with it? When are you going to do something with it? The history and story behind this timber is actually really fascinating and to be able to tell you more about it, I'm going to take you on a bit of a history tour now. So yours truly heralds from a town in country Victoria called Ichuka. Ichuka, which sits right on the banks of the mighty Murray River, is an Aboriginal word meaning meeting of the waters. Echuca and its neighbouring town Moema, which sits directly across the river, is colloquially known by locals as simply Echuca Moema. Indigenous people have populated this area for millennia, but the township of Echuca itself was founded in the 1850s when an ex-convict by the name of Henry Hopwood Australia was originally founded as a settlement for British convicts set up a hotel and punt on the Victoria side of the river. By the 1870s, Echuca had risen to prominence as Australia's largest inland port, being the shortest distance between the Murray River and the major city of Melbourne. So with all this progress comes the need to entertain as several halls and outdoor theatres sprung up. In 1923, the Temperance Hall that's pictured here was renovated to become the Paramount Theatre, a purpose-built cinema and live entertainment building which served the people of Echuca Moama for the next 54 years. Unfortunately, in 1977, the building was demolished to make way for a new theatre complex. It was at this time my now father-in-law and his father salvaged the valuable floorboards of the old Paramount and used them to build a mezzanine in the workshop of their engineering business, and this is where they stayed for the next 45 odd years. After nearly three quarters of a century and three generations of family working in that business, my father-in-law hung up the tools about two years ago. The mezzanine came down and I was fortunate enough to be given the opportunity to retrieve some of the timber from that. And that timber has been in my garage for probably the last two years. So for me and my family, this timber actually represents something that's quite sentimental to us. It represents not only a history in where we're from, but it's a history from our family. And as a result, I've been very selective in the projects that I want to build with this. Most of the things that I have done have been small things so far, but they've all reflected things that are for the family. So a special event is coming up in the future. My sister, younger sister, is expecting a, her first child. And I thought I would earmark some of this timber to make something to commemorate that event. So I'm going to make a small rocking horse that hopefully he or she can grow into um, as they get older. So before I start processing this timber, I'm going to first work on the templates for the rocking horse. The source of this template was bought some time ago and I've been spending some time converting it to a file that I can cut out on my laser. The laser really has been a wonderful addition to the shop. 
It's opened up an enormous world of possibilities and really has been the perfect device for making and cutting out template patterns. Once the templates are cut out, it's time to select our wood from our stash. I've selected some pieces I think that will clean up well, but as you can see they are in a pretty sorry state. There are decades of dirt, grime, grease and filth covering these, and we'll need to clean them all up before they go anywhere near my planer. It's important when working with any kind of reclaimed timber that we check for screws, nails or any other nasties that we definitely don't want to be going through our planer. Magnets are a simple option for doing this, but I recommend if you're going to be working with recycled timber regularly, then invest in a metal detector. Your machines will thank you for it. After removing a few nails, I'll next use my belt sander to get rid of the years of dirt and grime from the boards. Given how dusty these are, I did this outside since I don't want any of that floating around in my shop. As I've been sanding some of the dirt and grime and, and dust off these floorboards, you're starting to see some of the original, we'll call it patina, some of the original floorboard coming through. So it's pretty amazing to think that these are possibly well over 100, well they're definitely 100 years old plus, it's just a question of is it 110, 120, 130 years old, so yeah, these should come up really nice. The boards have an old style of tongue and groove in them which will need to be removed and it's easy to do this now on the bandsaw than trying to do it later on the table saw. So with the boards mostly prepped we can now run these through the planer. While technically I could have run these through the planer much earlier without sanding them first, it would have definitely resulted in me dulling the blades on my planer much sooner than is really necessary. Okay, so the next thing I need to do is to joint one edge. So get a nice clean straight edge down each of them and I'm going to use this jig that I made some time ago and it's a really simple and effective jig to make. Uh, all it is is a bit of form ply or plywood um, with a, a couple of toggle clamps uh, to uh, toggle on the work and the jig will run along the fence here and the piece of timber that you want to joint will overhang it. You'll run that through the table saw and you'll get one nice clean straight line down there. And then once you've done that, you can then uh, take it off the jig, flip it around on your table saw, run it through the other side, and you should get a nice parallel um, um, end to end or side to side here. So the jig works best when you have flat stock. So that's the reason why we've run them through the thickness of first to get these nice and flat and parallel. So even after a hundred years, these things are actually pretty straight and you can imagine they're pretty well dry. There's no uh, concern that they have too much moisture or anything like that in them. So we'll go ahead and joint them now and get one edge ready and then we'll see how much stock we have to play with. So jointing boards using this jig is really easy. First we mount the board to the sled using these toggle clamps. Then we run one edge through the table saw. And then we run the remaining edge up against the fence back through the table saw again. 
So after successfully planing and jointing our boards, I'll now make panels out of them. I'm going to use my domino joiner to help align the panels together and make the glue up a lot simpler. The dominoes aren't for any additional strength that it's going to add, but it's more about aligning the panels and making a glue up much simpler. Off camera I made two more panels which should be plenty enough to complete this project. Next I'll position and mark around the templates that I made earlier. Back at the bandsaw I switched out my resawing blade to the thinnest one I had and I used it to roughly cut out the shapes. With the shapes roughly cut out on the bandsaw, we can get a basic view of how this is going to come together. The next job is to trim the pieces to the template, and we do that over at the router table using a pattern bit. Double sided tape is handy here to fix the template to the workpiece. Now there is a good lesson to be learnt here when using a pattern bit, or really any router for that matter, and that's to take special consideration and notice of the grain direction of the wood. I completely forget this for a moment and make a bit of a rookie mistake as you're about to see. The first piece I was able to route with no real problems, but when I came to route the first leg piece, this happened. Well that didn't really go according to plan, so I've got a bit of chip out here and as I was rounding the corner here, it chipped out. To be honest with you, I think this is my own fault. I'm just trying to take off way too much material. I should go back to the bandsaw and just like come right up on the edge of it and that hopefully might help my chances because when I'm really digging into the material, it's grabbing and more likely going to do that. So. For this leg, I think we can fix this simply enough. I've still got the bit that came off it, so I think we can glue that back on. But before I keep routing out any of these, I think once I put the template on, I'm going to go back to the band store and just really sneak up on it so that I'm just removing a tiny amount of material and hopefully that should help. So after making those adjustments over at the bandsaw, it was back to the router and I had no more problems routing the rest of the templates from then on. So once templating is done, next comes sanding. There are a lot of curves and small hard to reach areas on this project, so ideally I'd love to have a spindle sander to make this easier, but unfortunately I don't. What I do have is some of these drill sanding drum adapters which still should do the job using my old drill press. It's obviously not as efficient as what a spindle sander would do but eventually this gets the job done and we can move on to sanding the rest of the parts. There are a couple of areas where there are some old nail holes which will need to be taken care of. I don't really want to hide them but instead leave them as a kind of a reminder of the history of where this timber comes from. 
So I'm just going to use a bit of medium CA glue or black CA glue to fill in those small voids. Before I glue the three panels together, I'm going to round over the horse's mane on the router as I won't be able to do this once I glue the other sections onto the main body. Then we can go ahead and think about connecting the three body pieces together. Now generally for spreading glue, I don't like to use those silicon glue spreader brushes. I've never really found them to work that well, and it's the reason why you often see me reverting to just using my finger. However, I recently tried a silicon spatula instead, and I found that that actually works really well for spreading glue. I only cost a couple bucks from the supermarket, so consider trying this if you're like me and don't like using those silicon brushes. After the first side dried, I attached the second panel of the horse's body off camera. This now completes the main body. With the main parts now done, it's time to get stuck into some serious sanding, and luckily for me, I'll be tackling that with my new sander. Recently, a friend who was upgrading his sander offered me an opportunity to buy his Merca for a very reasonable price. Considering how much these usually go for, I jumped at the chance to get my hands on a high-end sander for a really good price. I've been considering replacing my old Ryobi for quite a long time now, and this was just the perfect excuse to do so. I'll always think very fondly of my cheap and cheerful Ryobi sander, but the difference in both performance and results of this Merca is beyond measurable. And who knows, maybe this will help me learn to love sanding. That sounds a bit... That sounds a bit silly. One thing the new sander won't help with is unfortunately sanding these tight corners. So it's back to the drill press with the drum sanding attachment. This actually works surprisingly well and I think I might consider making some sort of base for this. Perhaps a future workshop project. The next step is to drill out the handle in the head of the horse. I could do this at a later stage but it makes way more sense to do it now while it's still possible to get this under the drill press. The final step on our way to doing some assembly is to soften all the edges with a subtle roundover on the router table. Now it's time to join some of these pieces together and I'm going to start with the legs. In order to make sure that they are spaced the right amount apart from each other to allow the body to slip between them, I cut out this template on the laser. This will allow me to perfectly center and space the legs on the base. To attach I'm just using a few dabs of CA glue and then I'll place some wood glue in between, but for additional peace of mind I'm also going to screw the legs to the base plate from underneath. The same template came in handy to mark the spots for the screws. To attach the leg bases to the main cross pieces, I first clamped them to the base and made sure that they were parallel to each other. Then using a force and a bit, I plunged into the sides to create a recess where I'll screw the legs to the base through this. 
I'll plug the holes up later with a dowel to cover them up and to make it an accent feature. So now to permanently fix these legs to the base, I'll remove the screws that I only just put in and apply some glue. It would have been difficult to glue and screw the base to the legs at the same time, so by doing it in this order, it means that I can easily reposition the legs to the base again once I put the glue on. It's sometimes a good idea to think about order of operations to make your projects go smoother, though that's often easier said than done. Off camera I used some 19mm dowels cut into small pegs on the bandsaw to use as plugs for the screw holes on the base. The contrasting colour of the dowel I think really works well against the lighter wood. I ummed an art about using the same technique to attach the upper legs to the body, but in the end I just went with glue. This was kind of a tricky job to try and get the glue coverage in the right spots while trying to minimise or reduce the amount of glue squeeze out because it will be very difficult to sand in those uh, hard to reach spots later on. The body needs to be in the right position to allow room for the saddle piece that goes underneath the seat, as well as making sure that the horse is, you know, reasonably balanced. It took a bit of manoeuvring, but finally we managed to get it in the right spot. Unfortunately we didn't do a great job of keeping the glue underneath the leg, and it looks like I'm going to have to come back and do a bit of sanding to remove that later on. We are pretty much on the home straight now, so a quick sand first to get rid of the glue marks left behind from before. Next I attach the seat which slots in at the top. The last component is the decorative saddle sides, and again, nothing more than glue to hold this on. The dowel I used to plug the hole legs is actually made from red gum, and I wanted to do the same for the handle. Off camera, I milled a piece of red gum 90mm square to match the diameter of the hole that I drilled for the head earlier. Then using a 9.5mm roundover bit, this hopefully should give me the perfect 19mm dowel. This is actually the very first time I've ever attempted making my own dowel. I just made sure to line up my fence parallel with the edge guide on the roundover bit. I also made sure that while I was routing, I didn't go all the way through and kept each end square. I repeated going around on all four ends and in the end I had a nice round dowel. After a quick sand to smooth out the transitions, I glued the dowel in place and trimmed to size. The final step is always the most satisfying one, and that's to apply some finish. I want to retain all the character of the wood, defects and all, so I'm just going to use a bit of hard wax oil to bring out the timber. It's always exciting to see the colour of the timber come out during this part. To get into all the nooks and crannies, I just used a paintbrush to work the wax into the wood. 
In the end, this was probably one of, if not my favourite project I've made to date. It's not really because of any technical challenge or complexity in the build itself that's made it satisfying, but there is something special about making, especially when using materials that have a meaning and a story that are then made into things that are hopefully going to continue that story. I think it's what sometimes makes woodworking so special and fulfilling. And to my future niece, if you're watching this one day, I hope you liked The Rocking Horse and enjoyed its story and how it came to be. Thanks everyone for watching, and I'll see you on the next one. The back cannot be at the front, dickhead. Tiny a little bit of a root. What do they call them? Don't know. Don't know. Fair bit of shonky shit going on here. Scalalicious. Oh, f dead. It's weird wood magic that I don't like. But I want to do the things to show you the things and for me to learn things.